Well, thank you so much. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've had, I met Jeff, you know, at Logan Airport, and we had a great chat. I dominated the conversation, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, he was a great listener, and I told him many a tale, and uh, Jen, and you know, so many of the others, and some students here, and uh, other guests. And uh, you know, just, uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, be here so far, and I hope I don't disappoint. And so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, we're got, we've got uh, what I hope is an interesting slideshow. There we go. Okay, so we're, we're going to be talking about, obviously, my book, The Hammer and the Anvil. But I thought that what I would do first is uh, give a little recap of my comic book career, since that's how it started. And also to mention a little something that, uh, oh, it, I'm very proud of too, in, in, a, in a fan sort of way. Uh, I was born and raised in North Dakota, and I moved to um, New York, Brooklyn, uh, in the uh, 19, late 1970s. And obviously, since I was from North Dakota, my baseball team was the Minnesota Twins. <laughs> yes, well, this past year, our, our team didn't go anywhere, you know, and I uh, don't have too much hope for uh, next year. But one of the things is that before David Ortiz became a Red Sox, he was a twin. So since my team wasn't going anywhere, I began rooting for David Ortiz this year, big time. And what I can say is, Congratulations, and Boston strong. <laughs> it was fun. Would have been more fun if my twins were in it, but uh, you can't have everything. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do is, as I said, just uh, begin by talking about how I got started in this wacky world. My first published work, 1977. Spidey Super Stories was a kid's version of the Spider-Man comic book series, published in, uh, it was a collaboration between Marvel and Children's Television Workshop, the people who produced Sesame Street. Uh, you know, and it was the cover feature, uh, Spidey and Thor teamed up against Loki. Now, truth to tell, it's a very, very simple story, and actually I, the editor rewrote most of it, but still, it got my name out. And then this is my adult uh, Spider-Man story, uh, a uh, story about capitalism gone amok, uh, called Scared to Succeed. And the reason was uh, that a business, a corporate executive literally signed a deal uh, to push his company, in order for his company to succeed, he had to keep doing business plans uh, and uh, sales efforts to grow the business. And the, the minute that he stopped, uh, well, this assassin, you know, that guy in the background there, would come and lop off his head. A typical comic book story. Uh, from Marvel, I went over to Topps. Uh, they're more known for their sports, their baseball trading card company. Uh, and you know, at the height of the comic book boom, uh, they hired me and my best friend at Marvel a way to start their comic book division. <clears throat> and ultimately, I became uh, executive editor, and I wrote uh, Mars Attack stories, and also an X-Files. Uh, I was the X-Files editor. Topps did mostly licensed product uh, th uh, comic books based on TV and movie properties. X-Files was one. Uh, Xena, Warrior Princess was another. We did Jurassic Park and a variety of other movies. This particular story was set in my hometown of Devil's Lake, North Dakota, which had all kinds of X-Files type elements. It had nuclear missile silos, uh, the, the town's name Devil's Lake, and then the lake of the same name. Uh, it had a National Guard base, uh, an Indian reservation, a landmark, a hill called Devil's Heart, and a few other things that uh, just lent itself. And, and then in the middle of the story, I wrote in my mom. 
Well, I had to. Okay. Um, the thing with Hammer and Anvil, and then also for those of you who have seen uh, my Vietnam graphic history, I was able to combine my comic book experience with that of my military history experience. <coughs> Excuse me. My first foray into that is this Princess Diana graphic biography. Uh, and for those, uh, well, actually most of us, I would be familiar with uh, the phenomenon of uh, Princess Diana of Wales. And in the immediate aftermath of her death, the incredible outpouring was such that I convinced my publisher that, yeah, we should get on the bandwagon too and do a graphic biography. And she was the most photographed woman in the world. And literally every panel in that biography has specific visual reference. Uh, as I said, this was my first attempt to do nonfiction in the graphic format. Uh, the comic book industry went bust in the late 1990s, 1998, 1999, and shortly after that, I shifted over from the comic book side of the business to the book trade, working for a small publisher. And this is, you know, okay, and at that, with that publisher, I ghost wrote a number of uh, young adult histories of World War II, Civil War, Western expansion, uh, and the Revolutionary War. Uh, these came out under the uh, names of James McPherson, Phil Caputo, Benson Bobrick. And it was a great experience working with these uh, gentlemen. Um, I learned an awful lot, both about my own writing ability and working with such obvious big names who were listening to me. <laughs> That's unknown, really. I, I, I joke with people. I say, I've got a long name in the industry. I don't have a big one. But anyway, the, the nice thing was that uh, when you're working with people like this, well, you can call in favors. So with my first book, uh, under my name, First Command, which is a young adult biography of the first commands of generals, m many of them famous in our history, because uh, we know what Eisenhower, Patton, MacArthur, Washington, Grant were like at the top of their game. But they all had to start somewhere. Where was it? What did they do? Did they succeed? Did they fail? And if they failed, then, well, then how did they pick themselves up and go on? Because obviously they, they were successful. And I felt that that would be something that kids, young, a young adult audience, could identify with. And uh, fortunately, I got uh, James McPherson to do the introduction, and Phil Caputo and a variety of other big names uh, gave me some wonderful quotes. And, you know, and of course, the book died in the market. It did get turned into a TV uh, miniseries that was shown on the Discovery Channel, uh, the military channel. And I was one of the talking heads. I was an executive producer as well. Uh, so that was fun. Yeah, but I wish the book had been more successful. But you guys are going to get copies of that thing. Um, this is another book that I wrote, uh, a survey of uh, wars from ancient to present time, uh, American wars you know, all around the world, major, obscure, whole nine yards, uh, strategies and philosophies, uh, pivotal weapons, uh, very fascinating thing. Uh, absolutely loved doing it. And the fact that I was being paid to do something that I love was even better. This is a recent, and this is uh, I'm probably the book that I'm most proud of. Um, this is about uh, men in our recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, who received, and some of them posthumously, uh, our nation's highest decoration for military valor, the Medal of Honor. In addition, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, this book has, for the first time, the complete history of the Medal of Honor itself. Because since Vietnam, so few, decor so few Medals of Honor had been uh, awarded that basically we've forgotten what the decoration means. And this helped give it perspective. 
And the history is not a very pretty one, which also helps explain why it is so, so few of them are awarded nowadays. And uh, right now, in a, uh, I am working on two graphic books. Uh, one is a graphic history of Area 51. Uh, yes, that Area 51. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, also one, a graphic novel adaptation of a business novel that uh, is really, uh, well, really popular. I didn't, I had never heard of it, but uh, it sold four, four million copies and I said, wow, that, that's something. So let's talk about uh, Hammer and the Anvil. And I am going to go, here we go. Now, we're going to start by uh, the script. Let's get down to a page here. Now, Comic book scripts, basically, okay, yeah, and I got to do a little bit of explaining here. That personally, I have a problem with the term graphic novel, the term graphic history, and graphic biography. There's something about that adjective graphic that, that just makes it seem like we're getting down and dirty into something that's kind of seamy. I mean, you know, a, 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 there's a graphic depiction here, fella. I mean, of what? I don't, I don't know if I want to see that. But So I, used, uh, I, I grew up with the term comic book. You know, these just happen to be longer forms of a comic book. So you know, you'll just have to bear with me. On, that's, that's my quirk. Okay, as I said, there are two types of the scripts for a comic book story, you know, whether it's you know, the long graphic novel form or the short you know, magazine format. Uh, fall under two broad categories. One is called the Marvel Method, and the other is called Full Script. Now, the Marvel Method, which is actually how I first learned how to write comics, is, uh, was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, uh, the publisher, writer, <clears throat> and artist, respectively, at Marvel Comics. And essentially what it was is a uh, brainstorming session in which Stan would write the plot which was simply a, just a series of paragraphs. It wasn't even broken down by page. And then he would hand it to Jack, or and sometimes Jack would just simply you know, brainstorm on his own, and who would break it down into uh, the individual uh, pages of artwork that you would ultimately see. And then what Stan would do is he would take the, the artwork, which did not have any text on it, and he would work off the images creating the dialogue and the captions that you would later see in print. The other method is called full script. And as you can see here, for those of you who may have seen movie scripts, or things like that, the, the formatting is very similar. The, the real difference here is that you see up here, it includes the art instruction and then the text that will ultimately appear in print. Now, Excuse me. Um, so I am actually the choreographer and the script writer. And uh, a full script really requires a writer to have a very acute visual sense. Some people, you know, it, they acquire it through um, work. You know, sometimes it comes naturally. I was a, a hybrid. I had a knack for composition and thinking visually. I can't draw, and as I told others here, and I can prove it, but I do think in a visual manner. And the crude things that I would do, uh, my sketches for covers and things like that, well, artists understood where I was coming from, thank God, because I, uh, I was dead otherwise. So what you're seeing here are my instructions for this particular, on page one, panel, page three, I'm sorry, panel one, um, we're doing the time of day, setting, uh, an exterior. Thomas Link, this is Abraham Lincoln's father, is building a coffee, coffin for uh, his wife, Nancy. Uh, this is Lincoln's mother, who had just died. Okay, now, you're seeing the, uh, this material here in blue? Okay, this was done later, following uh, suggestions from my editor. 
uh, who, uh, you know, he got that first draft and then came back to me with, uh, you know, edits. And that's where you're seeing, you know, the, the additional text that's been added. And in some cases in panels, as you can see there. Now, you see here, we went through a third iteration. That's where this red is. Um, so now we're going to go from there to the art. And here, OK. Uh, want to just bear with me a moment here. Um, there it is. There. OK. These are the pencil breakdowns of the artwork. Now, comic book artwork is done, usually there are two artists involved. One's called a penciler artist, and the other's called the inker artist. And the terms describe how they do their work. In other words, a pencil artist literally draws the illustration in pencil. And it can be pretty sketchy as you're seeing here, or it can be really refined, almost finished art, but in pencil form. The anchor will take that illustration, and even in this crude form, and will turn it into the lined artwork that you see actually printed on the paper. Now, the, the advantage here is that, okay, now you're, you know, you're seeing the integration, the overlay of the text on the page itself. Okay, and then we can go to, okay, so this is, the, this is the page that you just saw the text for earlier that has been broken down into the basic illustration. And this is actually one of my lighter copied pages. The, the challenge, pre, the, the real difference between writing something like this and a story of fiction is, well, the beauty about fiction is it's a pack of lies. I mean, you know, you make up, in, you can do whatever you want and people will buy into it. You know, and I use as the ultimate example of this, Finnegan's Wake. Not only is it a pack of lies, it being a dream, but it's an unreadable pack of lies on top of that. <laughs> and people still buy the darn thing. Oh, well, maybe I'm jealous. <laughs> okay, being serious. Um, the big thing is that you have to be accurate here. Um, whether it's, you know, the attire, the setting, uh, the weaponry, you know, the accessories, uh, the dialogue. The, you know, it, it also helps to be able to do uh, likenesses well, because if Lincoln doesn't look like Lincoln, then you know, your credibility is shot. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis in the recent Lincoln movie, uh, the makeup people did an absolutely incredible job. You swore that that, that was Lincoln, uh, even though, of course, none of us were around back then. But uh, here you can see, okay, this is really a crude form, it's, so it's just basically blocking out Lincoln's face. Uh, the you know, finished version looks a lot more like him. But you see, you know, he was famous for walking in the fields with his books, uh, reading nonstop, <coughs> self-educated. Oh, and by the way, um, to forestall any questions, I am self-taught as a writer. I did not attend, in fact, I did not attend college. I worked at a university, but I never attended it. Uh, I got in on the printing side of things. I went to, to a trade school uh, to learn the, the art of printing because publishing involves printing. And I figured, well, people try and get in the front door, I'm going to get in the side. Is the idea being you get in however you can, and then once you're in, then you can you know, move around. So my first jobs at Marvel, actually, was working in production. This was back in the days where you did mechanical paste-ups with either rubber cement or hot wax, or sometimes both. Uh, and boy, that rubber cement was you know, vicious <laughs> after a while. So with, uh, with hammer and anvil, 
not only did I have the challenge of making sure that I was historically accurate, and fortunately, there was so much uh, written by Lincoln and Douglas that the dialogue that I was able to use is basically I was either lifting speeches or adapting letters that they had written. So I was able to, I was really grateful for the fact that I was able to use actual comments that they made, whether written in letters to their friends or business associates or you know, fellow politicians, or in speeches they actually wrote them uh, and said themselves. Of course, then I had to figure out how to condense these speeches because this was an age of oratory. Uh, the, there's a famous anecdote about the, the, Gettys, uh, the event at Gettysburg where Edward uh, Everett did this speech that lasted almost three hours, which was really typical back then. Uh, sorry, there. Uh, and then Lincoln comes in at the end, you know, you know, he, he's up next, and he delivers a speech in less than two minutes, and frankly, most everyone wasn't prepared for it. You know, they, you know, they settled in, you know, they just heard this massive you know, recounting of the, the battle itself, and Lincoln says the most potent political speech you know, in the history of the United States. And even though there was a huge crowd there, almost no one remembers it. We, you know, we only remember it through the, uh, the text. So I had to condense. But here's the other problem. It's a story about two guys and what do they do in their life? They sit around or they stand around and they talk. Now there's nothing more visually boring than a person standing there talking on a stage. So I was groping all over there, trying to find uh, dramatic scenes of one sort or another. And you, thus you see this scene right here, which is uh, that of the, okay, uh, this is, Frederick Douglass, uh, as a kid, he had just been separated from his grandmother. So he's going through that early trauma of separation, the cruelty of the slave, you know, the situation the slaves had with breaking up of families. And he is in the kitchen, you know, underneath the stairs uh, or in a closet, and the slave master, uh, the master of the house, is whipping the backs of this uh, slave woman who had been seeing this slave man, uh, and, the, and the owner didn't like it. Uh, he, he had warned her not to uh, see him, and of course she disobeyed, and he caught, caught the two together, so he's punishing her. So I'm going, oh, a dramatic scene. I can work with this. I, you know, finally, I've got some action. Uh, but most of the times, there, there's very little action, and I had to find some, I would look at a scene and where can I draw out the most drama in it? Uh, whether it's through the dialogue, uh, asking Wayne Van Zandt, who is an absolute joy to work with. Yeah, he, did, he also did my Vietnam graphic history and uh, I did an excellent job with that. But as you can see here, a lot of the, uh, okay, that's, okay, we, Go to the next section. A lot of it is just uh, standing around, you know, and people talking, especially when we get to the politicians talking. Yeah, yes, they're they're being rather angry here, but uh, they're still standing around and talking. Um, ah, and then there was the biggest challenge of all: the language itself specifically the racist language that was endemic during that period. And we know which word I'm talking about. Back then, of course, it was just as common as heck and darn are here today. No one th thought anything of it, except those who, who were uh, abused by it. So in the state of hi historical accuracy, I asked my editor and publisher, what about that word? Because we know they used it all the time. 
and some classes even more than others, but even the liberals, the abolitionists used it. It was a part of life. And it was our, you know, I said, what do we do? What do you want me to do? And they blinked. Not in the sense that they said we couldn't do it, but they said, it's your choice. <laughs> I mean, fine. Um, well, obviously, if I used it, the book would die in the market. I mean, Mark Twain with Huck Finn and you know, Tom Sawyer, you know, it's in there. But my name's not as big as Mark Twain's. <laughs> not anywhere close. And, you know, it, it's like, well, okay, I can be historically accurate and the book's, you know, going to sit in the warehouse. Or I can find a more or a less inflammatory word that to people who are, you know, aware of what really went on during that period, they can just, you know, insert it as accordingly. And that's where I used, you know, I found a substitute of boy. Yeah, uh, right there. Because they used that too. That, yeah, um, and so I had to make a compromise. A pragmatic one. These are the kind of decisions that uh, authors uh, have to make, especially when we're looking at uh, works for the young adult audience. Uh, books for the adults, and also it's also the it's a fascinating difference between a book that is all text, and this is where the term graphic is more appropriate. Somehow they are more powerful when you have these visuals involved. Uh, it is a fascinating thing. I've seen you know, examples, especially uh, at Marvel, where um, stories involving Nazis, and you'd see this big swastika on the cover, uh, it created a huge uproar. Uh, this happened in the early 1990s, even though the, you know, um, the villains were Nazis, and it was an integral part of the story. But uh, there was uh, Marvel came under criticism for it was absurd glorification of uh, the Nazis, and saying, "Well, okay, I, that's not the case." But no, I didn't write that story. It was someone else who had to work on that. The other thing about hi historical accuracy is uh, using your sources. Frederick Douglass wrote three autobiographies, and all three of them ha are different. In, uh, they have different facts. They tell the same story in slightly different ways, and, even, and his memory failed him, sometimes deliberately so. So you had to be careful about what you were using from him, and I would more use his material for dialogue and use biographers' works for the actual uh, chronology of events. Uh, because with his wife, uh, Anne, Anna, she was critical for getting him out of Maryland. Uh, they were engaged at the time. But in, in Douglas's autobiographies, she gets virtually no mention of the role that she played in helping him escape to the north. There were reasons for that, and it related to emphasizing Douglas's heroic struggle to free himself. And it had to be himself, you know, acting alone. Inaccurate, but that's the way it was. And the thing about Abraham Lincoln that I discovered as we went through this story, now I'll get to the finished art, was his growth as um, a maturation and 
development of his attitude regarding slavery. He always hated it. But once he became responsible as president, at CD, there, okay. Now you can see what the artwork was like. Uh, those of you who haven't seen, you've seen copies of the book. Uh, the finished material, there is the, that er early scene. So you see how well developed it is. Uh, the further step wa was that we used color to accent when we were doing shifts from Lincoln to Douglas and back and forth. And toward the end of the book, when they come together, that's when we go for color, which I thought was a very clever use of uh, the medium that way. And uh, one of the things where my publisher got right. Lincoln was very cautious on the subject of slavery. He recognized his limitations, his constitutional limitations as president. And he went out of his way to reassure the South that he wouldn't touch it within states that already had slavery. Now, he, he was honest. He said, no, I don't like it, but I'm not going to touch it. But that 1861 inaugural speech did not convince Southerners. Uh, it, uh, sadly, the the firebrands that were controlling the political, uh, that had the political reins in the South uh, were dead set against staying in the Union so long as Lincoln was around because they truly believed that he would do something, anything, to break their power. Well, thus we had the Civil War and ultimately, yes, he did break their power. But Lincoln initially tried everything he could, even after the war had started, to seek an accommodation with e eliminating slavery over time. Um, he spoke with leaders in the, well, at, at, at that time, the neg Negro community on the subject of colonization whether it was to Liberia or to a colony in Panama, because he, he felt that the white race and the black race really couldn't exist side by side. He, he was very much a man of his century. But as a man of his century, then he became a leader in a, the most progressive movement imaginable, that of emancipation. He was never an abolitionist. But he did believe firmly in emancipation. And when the, coloniz when the Negro community rejected colonization, he went to the uh, leaders of the slave states that were still in the Union, you know, Kentucky, uh, Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, and tried to convince them that let's go the way of gradual emancipation, uh, that it's compensation, paying the slave owners for their slaves, freeing them, and working out a system that gradually removes slavery from the economic character of our nation. And unfortunately, they rejected him. So ultimately, he said he's tried this, that, tried every way short of outright emancipation he said, finally, I'm going to have to do this. There's no other way. Also, the way the war was going, he said, it has now become an integral part of the war, and thus he issued his Emancipation Proclamation. It was the most important moral act of his presidency, the bravest one. And it, uh, Frederick Douglass had been hammering him. The, the hammer and anvil uh, is the imagery, this was my editor who suggested the title. Douglass was the hammer pushing Lincoln, the anvil, to, to make him act to free slaves. Douglass wanted it now, but Douglass was a single issue 
uh, populist in that respect. Uh, well, he was an abolitionist, and he had every right to be. I mean, he was a slave. He had been whipped. Uh, he had suffered. Though, truth to tell, for many years, he was, he had it very well insofar as slaves went because he was a household slave. And in the hierarchy of slavery, the lowest on the totem pole were the field hands. The highest ones were those who were servants in the master's house. So, yes, we are talking about uh, a terrible institution, but what Douglas tended to want to downplay is the fact that insofar as slaves went, he had a pretty good insofar as his working environment. The, uh, <clears throat> so, ultimately, uh, these two men reached a, 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 friend, a, a genuine friendship. Uh, Lincoln tried to keep Douglas away, you know, at, at arm's length as long as he could, but gradually the two of them did find a means to accommodate each other, and that accommodation led to a genuine friendship that was de demonstrated uh, after, uh, in the celebration of Lincoln's second inaugural, where Douglas went to the White House to congratulate the president, and a guard attempted to stop Douglas and prevent him from you know, entering, and Douglas said, you tell Mr. Lincoln that I'm here, and I'm sure that he will want me to come in. And sure enough, that's, that's exactly what Lincoln did. And publicly, in the, you know, in the White House, in front of all these guests, Lincoln separated himself from the people that he was talking to, walked over, grabbed Douglas by the hand, shook his hand, and publicly met him as an equal, which given the time and the endemic racism throughout the nation, because you have to remember, even the abolitionists did not feel that the Negroes were the equal to the whites. Uh, when Douglas broke off from his abolitionist uh, supporters to do his own newspaper, you know, they poo-pooed it. They said, you have no experience there. You're a great symbol. You're a great speaker. You're a great everything else but a newspaper publisher and editor. Leave that to us experts. We can handle it. And he said no. And yes, those first issues of you know, his newspaper were pretty rough, and he had a rocky time of it. But he persevered, trial by, tra by trial and error, and it worked. He proved it. And okay, he, there were a lot of people who didn't like him. But, you know, but uh, he, he was having none of their prejudice. He said, uh, when Lincoln died, so much was left unfinished. And that is where Frederick Douglass's influence slipped into decline. Uh, Lincoln was, in many cases, his patron, more indirect than direct, but it was Lincoln's stature that gave Douglas more authority than he otherwise would have had. And with Lincoln out of the picture, that's where you started seeing this marginalization of Douglas that was accelerated after the election of 1876 in which the Republican Party essentially ended Reconstruction. Lincoln was very prescient when he said during the Civil War that he felt it would take about 100 years for African Americans to get on an equal stature with white Americans. And he was almost to the year exact because in 1964, President Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, 
signed the Civil Rights Act of 1864 that eliminated the Jim Crow laws and the other unfair measures that uh, ruled political life in the South and gave full equality to African Americans. I've said my say, so I now open the floor to questions, and I will be happy to answer anything and everything from my writing experience, comics, history, and anything in between.